like to thank everybody for taking the time on a busy schedule. And on uh, what, you know, I don't know, the last day we saw the sunshine. So, the, well, I probably shouldn't say that. Don't even turn around the phone. Uh, it looks like it's starting to rain. Um, and shortly I'll turn it over to Superintendent Dan Larson and go through a few things where we're at with the facility planning and discussion. Um, and uh, this is similar to what we have for staff meetings. Uh, we try to fold those tables in the back because everybody kind of tries to tend to go to the back. So we'll make sure we have everybody's up here. Uh, and within uh, um, speaking distance. So with that, uh, again, I appreciate all of your time here uh, tonight. Um, I think we have two parts tonight. Lane um, will go through where we're at with facilities discussion, where we're going, and then uh, we'll turn it over to the FJJ folks and talk about uh, going into the um, listening session component and the feedback. So with that, Lane Larson, if you want to um, Thanks. take a Thanks, part. John. Yeah. Actually, I don't, yeah, I want to start too by saying thank you for coming. On we we do have sunshine again, and so I was thinking that there, we might not have a very large turnout, but I'm thrilled by this that you all came. So thank you for coming. As John said, um, tonight's going to be kind of two parts, and you can kind of call it three parts actually, because Steve Lund, our business manager for the school district, and I are going to start by giving an overview of the building project. Um, most of you probably know that I came in July, and there was a lot of work that had been done prior to my arrival. And so Steve is going to take you through the past two years, and then I'm going to take you through since I've been here in July and what the plan and the phases are as we move forward. When we're done with that, that'll take about a half hour. Then we're going to turn it over to FJJ, and then we're going to have just really a fun activity where you get to provide input as far as what you think the strengths of the district are, challenges for the district, and recommendations that you have for the district. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for being here. It's just fun to see this great turnout, and I'll turn it over to Steve. All right, thanks, Lane. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, can everybody see the screen? Pretty decent. I don't care about the people over here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I just want to make sure that's that that's what I was thinking. Should we tilt it just a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I'm turn this thing just a little bit. Can sure they see it? Um, tilted like that? Here okay. again. Can um, they see it over here? Okay. No good. All right. All right. So, yeah, thanks, Lane. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing. We've actually been at this for about two years now, um, doing some facility planning work, um, taking a look at a lot of information uh, over the past two years. So I'll, talk, I'll spend some time about that, and then turn it back over to Lane. Lane's going to talk about where we're going to kind of go from here. So, and, you know, I've been mentored uh, by many different people over the course of my career, uh, but I got the opportunity to be mentored by a gentleman by the name of Bob Gross last year. And Bob uh, taught me that everything we do is about this moment in time uh, between a teacher and a student. Okay. And whether you're here to be part of creating that moment or supporting that moment, never forget it's about that moment. Okay. So while we're going to spend a lot of time talking about facilities tonight, keep in mind that everything at the core of what we do is about students. Okay. And facilities certainly are going to play a big part in that. So we're here tonight to share information, and we've got a lot of it to share with you. Okay. And we'll go through as quickly as we possibly can, because we also want to gather some feedback from you tonight. Okay, not only about Forest View, we want to hear about Forest View from you, but also about the entire district. We really need to kind of gain uh, your perspective. So, let's talk about the work that we've been doing the past uh, couple of years. We've been doing a lot of gathering of information, a lot of information about our demographics in terms of our student enrollment, what we currently have, and what we can expect in student enrollment over the next decade. We folded that enrollment information into our space, what we have for space to serve the students we have right now, and what we should perhaps uh, be positioning ourselves for space in the future, given our enrollment projections. And then we took the opportunity over an entire summer and scoured our buildings. A group of engineers plus a district staff uh, went from basement all the way up to rooftops and really dug into those things that we need to be attending to over the foreseeable future and maintaining in the facilities that we have. Okay, we start to put some numbers to that. We're going to go through that. But first, let's talk about enrollment. We would love to stand here and tell you that our enrollment is going to be that top line as we move into the next 10 years, but that just simply isn't what our demographic shows. 
what we do show is that over the next 10 years, we have about three different scenarios that could perhaps play out with our enrollment. It could be as low as about a growth of 261 students over the next 10 years, and that's the entire district K-12, okay? It could be a midpoint of about 473, a little less than 500 students over the next 10 years, and, and as high as about 700, okay? But what's important to note in this, if you look at any one of those, it's not really insurmountable. You can see that really, uh, in any one of those scenarios, we have average annual growth of 1% or less. And when we've done a lot of this planning work, we've usually used that middle growth area and really kind of gain kind of that middle ground perspective. Not really aiming for the high or necessarily shooting for the low, okay? So as we then folded that demographic information uh, into our space and, and talking about the space that we currently have and then looking at it strategically to what we should position ourselves for the future, we looked at capacity. Okay? And when you measure capacity for school building, it's not only just about classrooms and the number of kids you have in those classrooms, but it's also about the core and supportive spaces that you have in these buildings, such as the space we're in right now, the cafeterias, the media centers, the gymnasiums, and most importantly, to our outdoor space, our playgrounds. So when you really take a look and carve all that up and determine what kind of adequate capacity we should have in each one of our buildings, you can see that on an elementary perspective, we're really tight. Okay, so when we look, and if you've been in our elementary schools, you can kind of see and you can feel that. So right now, based on our capacity um, calculations, we show that we have about, we have space for about 2,150 students K-4, okay? Right now, we have current enrollment about 2,450, about 300 difference of that. And as we look at that average, we go back to that previous slide, using that average middle line, you see that we should perhaps position ourselves for about 2,625. So right now, just in our elementary spaces, we show a need for about 300 uh, uh, spaces for about 300 students. Now that can actually grow as high as nearly 500 using those projections over the next 10 years, okay? From a middle school perspective, okay, we feel we've done a lot of things right now. And one thing that we did do right was we built a big Okay, so if you look at that average growth then from the previous slide, we can, we can see that we should position ourselves for uh, somewhere around 2,120 students in grades five through eight over the next decade. This, this building has the capacity to be right around 2,200. So we're positioned by, from a capacity standpoint. And when you then move to the high school, you can see then too, from just a solely a capacity um, standpoint, we're positioned fine there too. We have a lot of other things that we need to have conversations about relative to our high school, but from a space uh, perspective, we're sitting just fine. So I talk about the space, uh, the tightness of space that we have in our elementary schools. And I, like I said, if you've been in the elementary schools, you can really feel it, you can really kind of see it. If you haven't, it kind of looks like this. We've created spaces out of spaces in order to make room for individualized growing needs and individualized and specialized learning, okay? We've also created spaces out of areas that haven't probably been used for learning over the course of time. We've moved learning out into the hallways in many of our buildings to create spaces for that uh, individualized attention that our students need. And we've taken what have traditionally been storage areas and we've moved learning into those, which means we've moved our storage next to our boilers and in our basements, okay? Our next project is a Pearson in which we're going to have to probably create some learning space on the stage in the gymnasium. We're just that type. So to kind of gain a, a perspective of, uh, well, how do we compare? I mean, are we truly really that tight on space? We usually do a lot of comparisons with a peer group, and these are going to be districts that are similar to us, similar to us in size. They're going to be in communities that are also similar to ours. South Rapids, Sartell, Wilmer, Alexandria, St. Cloud. You may recognize some of these because they're in our conference. We play football against them and basketball and um, compete against them uh, from an athletic standpoint. But they're also our peer group. So when you look at comparison, and this is just that broad level square foot per student, just that high level comparison, you can see that based on MDE's guidelines, they say that we should have somewhere between 125 to 155 square feet per student of space in our elementary buildings. 
And not surprising, many of these districts sit in that 140 average, 135 to 140 average. That's kind of the middle of the ground uh, according to the guidelines. But you can see where we compare at about 125. We're bookended between two other districts that are in kind of a similar situation uh, that we are with Bemidji and Moorhead. And you can see what Bemidji's doing right now. And you can see what Moorhead's doing right now. And in fact, I just read that Moorhead's not only did they Great, great ground for the new elementary school that are opening at this fall. Okay, so there's many districts across the state that are doing the very same planning work that we're doing to discover solutions that fit into their communities. Okay, just like we're doing right now. Let's talk a little bit about the condition of our facilities. We talked about scouring through the basements all the way up to the roofs and identifying uh, the things that we ought to be paying attention to from a maintenance perspective in the foreseeable future. But on a big scale, our district, we're a large district, okay? We're the fifth largest district in outstate Minnesota, educating about 7,000 students pre-K uh, through 12th grade. But we're big geographically, too. We're 516 square miles. We educate these kids in about uh, 12 buildings, and we care for 1.2 million square feet that, that sits on about a half section of property. When you look at those 12 facilities from an age perspective, you can see they travel down from the oldest one being in 1929 all the way down to the newest one that we're sitting in right now, constructed in 2004, being Forestry. And what's interesting to note about this, remember this is the course of nearly a century of time, okay? But what's interesting is when you follow the pattern here, you can see that in our community, we have replaced and added buildings about every 10 to 15 years. You can see that step. Until we got to about right there. At which time we constructed the, the high school in 1968 and took a 35 year pause before we constructed the building you're sitting in right now. Just from a broad perspective, if you think about it, with 12 facilities, if you were to replace one of those every 10 years, if you were on a 10 year replacement cycle, by the time you got back to that first one, it's gonna be 120 years old. If you wanna be on a 35 year replacement cycle, by the time you get back to that first one, it's gonna be 420 years old. So yeah, you might wanna think about a better balance of what that replacement cycle looks like for us. Now, how do we compare? We talked about comparisons before, and there again, let's use our peer group, uh, those districts that we compare ourselves to relative to the size of the district in comparison uh, community-wise. And you can see where the average age of our buildings lies in comparison to our peer group, okay? But then we also folded in those districts that not only do we compare ourselves to, but the districts that we compete with, our neighboring districts. And you can see where their facility age lies in comparison to ours. Now we've got one district that you can see is nipping at our heels relative to age with Wilmer, and you can see what they're doing in Wilmer right now. Okay, there again, districts are looking at many of the very same things, going through the, many of the very same processes we are to discover these solutions. Okay, so future maintenance. Talk about going through the basement to the roofs and identifying those things. Now those things are going to be things that are reaching uh, the end of their useful life. But we can identify what, what they are right now, where they are at in their useful life, and then start to project when we need to replace these things. Okay, And then start to put a dollar amount on what that could look like. It's also going to include things that we haven't necessarily had funding uh, to address. Some of those deficiencies such as accessibility. We still have two buildings in the district that are not ADA accessible. Okay? It's also going to be things that we need to enhance in our facilities, which is going to be secure entrance points. Okay? So we've identified a lot of things like that, but in general it's going to be things such as tuck point, making sure that the bricks are in place on our buildings. We've got a lot of bricks, a lot of roofs too, and making sure that we keep the outside on the outside of our buildings, not on the inside. Keeping our buildings heated and cooled, uh, boilers, and of course we maintain a sea of parking lots. They're expensive, boy, are they expensive to me. And it's going to be things just as simple as windows. That's going to be the future maintenance items, of, a glimpse of what those things are that we've looked at. And when you really take that work then and tally it all up, and you can put it in perspective of each one of the buildings. And it's not surprising when you look at this trend, you've got the oldest building of in Washington, 1929, it's nearing the century mark, <coughs> having the highest cost at about $20 million. This is in millions. 
okay? And not surprising, you can travel all the way down to our newest building and our largest building, mind you, having only about a million dollars, okay? So there's kind of that value of doing that replace that, continuing to do that replacement cycle and trying to manage that future maintenance cost, okay? But what's interesting is actually when you start to fold in the size of these buildings, okay? $20 million is a big, that's a big amount, okay? But Washington is a big building, it's about 140,000 square feet. So if you take that 20 million and divide it by 140,000 square feet, you come up with something about $145 per square foot. However, when you take some of the older buildings that aren't as large and take that future maintenance liability that, that leaves out there, for example, Lincoln and Harrison are good examples, those buildings are only about 30 to 35,000 square feet. So when you project out an eight to nine million dollar liability for future maintenance and divide it by that amount of square feet, you can really start to paint a different picture when you look at that trend, okay? And when you start to near something around 240, 250, you really start to inch yourself closer to replacement costs. Now that isn't the only thing that you're gonna to wanna to take into account when you start to develop a strategy for um, your, your facilities plan, but it should be probably something that Let's talk a little bit about forest view. I don't think we thank our community enough for investing in this building. We feel that this building is, a, is just a wonderful marriage uh, between efficiency and effectiveness. And effectiveness meaning the opportunities that exist out here for the students in grades five through eight. My kids went through it, okay? I can't imagine them not having the opportunities in the team areas and the grade levels all four years that they were here. I couldn't imagine that. So we're just so thankful that we got it. It's a wonderful treasure for us. And we feel it's a wonderful treasure for our community. A demonstration of that is the, the use that this facility gets. The demand on this facility is enormous. This is a glimpse of what that looks like from a scheduling perspective. We grab the calendar, the scheduling calendar from February. It's pumped full, seven days a week, okay? So a, a community asset like this should be used and we're thankful to have it and be able to offer its use to our community. But we have some things to address, no doubt. Anybody ever drop or pick up kids off of here? I know I did it for four years and it, and it tested my patience, okay? <laughs> so we know that that's on the radar. It's, we know there's a fix out there. It's gonna it have some dollars attached to it. We haven't had the ability to do that because if we're gonna do it, we wanna do it right. And with the amount of money that we receive each year to take care of 12 facilities, we just haven't been able to pull that off. But it's time. It's time to do it. Okay, so we know we need to address that drop-off pickup, certainly. We love the welcoming and inviting entrance to this building, but we know we need to beef up some security with it, too. Okay, so that's another thing that, that's on our radar screen relative to Forest View. Those things that, while the building is still fresh and it's still new, there are some things that we need to attend to. So as we begin to put all of this information together, we begin to look at things strategically, okay? And imagine what some solutions could be. And in, in that process too, we discovered some opportunities. And our discovery isn't done yet, okay? We've got a lot of work yet to do, and some of that work is tonight. But when we look at, preliminary look at it, you can see that in every one of our facilities could fit in one of these five R's. We know we need to do some right-sizing at our elementary. We know we've got some facilities that need some renewal. They need some attention. We know that in part of that, and maybe perhaps addressing our capacity, we need to reinvest in them. Perhaps make them larger, okay? We have some facilities that may have limitations on their, with their current use, but are still in relatively great shape. And perhaps would be better used if they were repurposed. And I use the term recreate, and I've used it uh, universally with replace. Because if we look to replace buildings, we cannot forget that the value of the school isn't the building itself, it's what happens inside of it. So if we look at a strategy that includes replacement, let's never forget that we want to replicate what's in the building in perhaps a different facility, okay? So this planning work got all finished up about the same time that we hired a brand new superintendent. And the school board looked at that superintendent and said, okay, Lane, where do we go from here? So, Lane, where do we go from here? Thanks. Yep. As you can tell, the last two years, there's been an awful lot of work done. A lot of work 
uh, like, like you said, from the very ground floor of each of the buildings all the way up to the rooftops. And if you were part of that whole process, I want to say thank you because I know there were many, many community members that were part of it, um, getting all this data and collecting it. As Steve said, when I came in July, one of the things the Board of Education said, okay, now we have this great big umbrella of all of the issues that we know that, that we've got regarding our facilities in these 12 buildings, but how do we prioritize? How do we determine what the items are that we must do and have to take priority in this facility project? And like I said, just to make sure that they're prioritized. So one of the things that we that we talked about at, as board, at the board level is the fact that when in our decision making, we need to make sure that all of our decisions put our students and their academics and their whole the experience within our school district at the forefront of our decision making. And we're doing that in this particular case through looking at the facilities throughout our, our district. When we talked about it, um, uh, we felt really good about the fact that the, the piece that was finalized in October that Steve went over, it really gave us a good idea of what the overall needs were. And so we felt that we had to start on the 50 yard line. If we were thinking of it as a football game, because of the fact that we know what the big picture is, now we get to focus. And so what are the priorities as we're going to be focusing? And that's um, listed up on the table or on the board right now. That we have eight priorities that we really wanted to take a look at. The first one is that we wanted to ensure the safety and security of every one of our buildings. So when our children come to our school, our staff come to our school, our guests come to our school, that everybody feels that we've done everything in our power that we can to ensure the safety and security of all those who come and are our guests in our home. The second uh, objective that we really wanted to focus on, Steve really talked about in great detail. It's a lot of the mechanical efficiencies and the educational adequacy needs of all of our buildings. It's looking at the facilities themselves, the roofs, the boiler systems, the HVAC systems, windows, etc. Things that cost a lot of money to repair, but those items you don't see any kind of a, of a difference as far as the educational offerings that we have within our school, but they're very costly. But we do know that we need to do that to, to take care of our buildings. The third bullet talks about we need environments that foster best practice instruction and 21st century learning. Um, when I came here, one of, the, one of the things I kept telling people is we need to be thinking more towards the 22nd century because of the fact that we're just about a quarter into the 21st century. And that being said, it, it's probably true, but it really looks like a, a huge endeavor. And so what we do is we kind of talk about, okay, we're 17 years into the 21st century right now, and let's think back to what 17 years looks like. What kind of changes have occurred in education? A lot of items, a lot of things. We now have new standards, we have new core standards, we have new best practice instruction for teaching the standards in each of the content areas. We have way increased technology throughout our, throughout our world that our kids are, um, that are available, that our kids um, are being made aware of. We have all kinds of changes that have occurred during that 17 years. If we look just at the next 17, what might that look like? And as we're looking at our facilities, we need to think about spaces that are flexible and that are useful as education changes that we can be flexible along with it. The next item is looking at um, spaces that promote robust opportunities in all four of the A's in the academics, the arts, the activities, and the athletics. One of the things we're very proud of here at Brainerd Public Schools is the fact that we have a really well-rounded curriculum. We have great opportunities for our children in all four of those areas of the A's. And it's because of the investment that all of you have made and the investment that the Board of Education has made to making sure that we have a well-rounded curriculum. 
and we want to continue to focus on our areas. areas. Another thing that's really important to us is providing, is ensuring the collaboration, the ownership, and the ownership in our, within our whole district, and to look at our workforce development. I, would, I want to talk about the first two terms first, because we know that any time that you're going to make something great happen, um, whether it's in a home or, or if it's in a school district or in a community, um, we're much more effective if we're working together. When I think about a school, I think about the fact that I want our school to feel like a home to everyone. That when you come here, like on an evening like tonight, that you don't want to leave that you feel welcome, the school climate, the culture of the buildings, they're warm, they're enduring, and it feels like home. And that's what school should feel like. When kids come there, that they always feel safe, that it feels like that place where we're working together. We um, see you have that really nice slide tonight. I liked it, showing you how busy Forest View is um, just in the months of February. Um, John was telling tonight, he said, this building has just been used for everything this, you know, the month of May and how it's useful. That's how school should be. We should be promoting our children in every opportunity we can, inviting the public to come in and to use our buildings because they belong to everyone. So we want to ensure that collaboration and that ownership in our buildings. One of the other things in this bullet, though, that we really want to take a look at, and we really had a wonderful opportunity to visit with chamber members um, during two of these listening sessions. And one of the things that we really know is an important piece in this collaboration is that our K-12 system uh, collaborates with our public, but also with our, with our college that we have right here in town. And one of the ways that we can do that through, is through all of our career and technical education offerings. Um, the chamber today, we talked extensively about the need for developing our workforce. We as a school district are responsible for making sure that our children have the opportunities and that they're given the skills and the strategies that they need to be successful and contributing citizens uh, when they enter the workforce. We also want to make sure that we're giving them what they need to be successful when they go to CLC. To, uh, and are able to extend their education to, uh, into a field that is part of their passion. Or we need to make sure if they're going on to a four-year college or to the military, that, that we are giving them what they need to be successful. We know that, that we graduate the best and the brightest students in the nation. And we want them to continue to, to be here or to come back home and to help to move our community forward um, as we move forward. We also, uh, one of the bullets that we have here is visionary technology integration. We talked a little bit about it just a minute ago about how technology has changed our world. Just um, in the last 17 years is what I talked about it before. But I think about it when I was in school, there, wasn't, there weren't even computers that we were able to use at that time. And yet now we look at, at all of the technology that's out there that our kids um, are around. I was telling that one of my favorite books that, that I've read within the last year or so is by Thomas Friedman. And it's a book called um, That Used to Be Us. And it talks about education and how it's changed and how all kinds of things that have happened in our world have changed education. And one of the things, and probably the part that I've highlighted the very most in my book and I've shared with my administrative team, is that they talk that there really are two achievement gaps in education today. One, we know that our learners are very diverse learners. Um, we have students with special needs. We have students that are gifted. And we know that our differentiated instruction is something that's very important for meeting the individual needs of our kids. And we really have a pretty good handle on it and figuring out what we need to do to help them meet, meet the individual needs of each child. Where he is saying that he, he believes that the biggest achievement gap that's coming, or and it's already starting to be here, is having to do with technology. And it has to do with the fact that we no longer are competitive just locally or within our state. 
But because of the internet, because of uh, technology and what a global world we have, um, we need to have be providing skills and opportunities with technology to our kids so that they are able to be successful um, in a really global society. It's, it's kind of exciting, but it really is an interesting um, piece that we need to think about. The next bullet talks about transparency, engagement, and community trust building. And we, one of the things that we've had so much fun with is coming out to meetings like this, going to civic organizations, and hearing from the public about what you believe are the strengths of our school district or our individual buildings, and also what you believe some of the challenges are as we move um, throughout this, this century, and what, what kind of advice you would like to give the decision makers in our school district as we're pursuing some kind of a plan for the facilities. And the next bullet that we have on the sheet, the objective is always making sure that we provide the highest quality educational opportunities for a taxpayer's generous investment. Um, I know that uh, in the last district I was in, this, this was an area that, that we really focused a lot on. And I remember that that was always in our decision making when we were talking about it, that we need to make sure that, because we know that any time you invest in some kind of a building project for a school district, it really is getting on your heart because you, it is a very, very generous given to the school district. And so we want to ensure each of you that we are going to provide the greatest opportunities for our kids in all of these areas as a result of that support for our school district. So how are we going to do this? These eight objectives are, are extensive. So um, in November, I brought forth a plan to the Board of Education where I felt that there were really six phases. Six phases for getting us to our end product. And I'm going to go through each of these um, real, uh, individually, but I'll just highlight them real quick. The first phase is an extensive communications plan uh, from the day one all the way through to the duration of the visit. Phase two are stakeholder engagement by holding internal and community uh, listening sessions. Phase three is some potential surveys and assessments that the board may look at. Phase four would be bringing all of the information together, bringing together a recommendation to the Board of Education, and having the board to decide what the project scope would be, what the options would be, and what the alternatives could be. And then they would make a decision that we would be moving forward into phase five, which is the one referee and election process. And finally, if um, we have a successful bond election, it would be a comprehensive construction management services. How would we move to transition to do the work that we're looking at in this year? So let's take them individually. The first one, phase one, is an extensive communications planning. We really have two objectives. One is to always communicate the vision for educational achievement throughout our district and what it is that our children need to be successful. The second objective that we have with our communication is that we want to give you the opportunity to have any questions that you have regarding our facilities and our school and our planning, that you have that at your fingertips and that you can access that. So we're planning to do this communications plan in a number of ways. We're going to use many of the traditional uh, communication pieces that we've talked about before where we do mailings. Um, some maybe where we'll have like pamphlets and placements, do articles in our local newspaper, uh, be a, uh, do one-on-one -on -one interviews at their, on the radio station, and more. And all of those are really effective methods that we want to continue to enhance and to continue to promote throughout our region. But we also know that there's a lot of people now that are using technology. They're accessing the newspaper on the internet, or they're going online to, to find out a lot of their information. And so our school district has put together a brand new website, which is called blueprint181.org. And we encourage and invite each of you to go to that website 
to find out all of the pieces that we have that we're putting together regarding the building we also, I have Carla Sand back here, our communications director, who's doing the videoing for us tonight. She's going to be having videos of each of these meetings on there. Any questions and answers that we have regarding the facilities will be on there so people can uh, find out the answers um, to those pieces as well. We also have um, extensive work on Facebook pages, Instagram, and more. And so you're going to see a whole bunch of new ways that we're going to be communicating throughout this process. And so please um, get involved and, and check out some of the things that we have. The second phase that we have is talking about the stakeholder engagement. There are two different kinds of listening sessions that, that we, we feel are incredibly important. When I came here and um, I saw the umbrella project that had been done over the course of the last couple of years, the board said, you know, where do we go from here? What, what do you need, Lane, to, you know, as we talk about this building project? And I said, I need to hear from the people. I need to have that one-on-one -on -one contact, the one-on-one -on -one opportunity for people to give input about what they think is great about our district and where we should go. Because the one thing that we want to do is when we do go to the voters, we want to make sure that we have a plan that everybody um, this is the right plan for the school district and that we're all working together towards that same plan. And so um, we've been doing um, what we call these listening sessions that you're at tonight. We've done about 60 of them within our school, um, education-based listening sessions with our staff members that we have, our teachers, our administrators, our support staff, and many of our students. I know even when I've been doing lunch with Lane lately, I've been adding a couple questions about the facilities for the kids at Forest View um, was the last one that we did a few weeks ago. And it's just awesome to hear the great results um, that the kids, the staff, and everybody are sharing. We've had about 60 of those meetings um, between February and, and right now, and, so, and that's something that we're going to continue to do. What we're doing tonight is the second part of this, our community stakeholder listening session. This is an opportunity where we get to hear from you. We get to hear from our school board, from our parents, civic groups, our community partners, our neighborhood schools, our community members throughout to hear what you believe that we should do in, with our district um, and to give you this information that we're talking about today. Um, the third phase that we have that we're moving into has, is really um, a phase where the Board of Education gets to make the, their decisions based on what they need. Before they can put together a plan and decide what they want to move forward with, they may have some additional questions and need some additional data. And so some of the opportunities that they may choose to do to gain more feedback and more information are some of the following that are up here. They may look at some po public polling, or they may do some surveys of many, of probably hundreds of families throughout our school district. Um, there's a number of different ways that they do that now. Sometimes they'll do a telephone survey of several hundred families. Um, sometimes they'll do an online survey that people can fill out. Sometimes they'll still do a mailing um, through um, the United States mail. And what, it, what, what I have found in the past is that sometimes people prefer that. Because for some, coming to a night meeting might not be um, ideal, might not be able to make the schedule. Or sometimes people just really want to be more anonymous and um, not vocalize things publicly, but they still want that opportunity to share what they're thinking. Um, some other ones that the board may look at is a voter profile analysis. They may decide to do an update on the demographics that Steve talked to you about a little bit ago. Um, because when that demographic study was done, it was about two years ago. And we've now had two more years worth of births within, within our school district. And so we can see if the demographic data is following that trend line that he shared with you. Is it higher? Is it lower? Um, how does that work? And so we may get to a point where we want to just reaffirm that the demographic study is what, what's been projected in the past. Another one that I think is kind of fun is the GIS mapping, where the school district can find out 
where the children are being born within our school district. So if we do add space and resize a particular building, we're sure that it's the building where the growth is happening, that that's where the enrollment is going to be increasing in that area. And we certainly want to make sure that we're doing a very extensive overview of the district financial situation, different funding sources that we have both within our, our current budgets right now and looking at some alternative um, ways of funding um, some pieces um, as, alongside with the bond referendum to make sure that we have the best financial picture that we can possible and to communicate um, what the plan is that way. I know that um, Steve and I have met many times already talking about the financial review of our current uh, budget within our district and how that could look and what funds will um, address groups, what funds will address health and safety uh, issues like the security and some of those types of things. Phase four then um, brings all of this information uh, from Foster Jacobson Johnson, Winsett Smith Nolte, and Crow Sanderson. Um, all the information that they're collecting for us and we're going to bring it forward to the Board of Education so that they can make the right decision as to what they move forward with. Some of the things that the Board will be looking at are the project costs and budgeting. They could be looking at quantifying and comparing the operating costs and what some savings would be. For instance, if one of the buildings needed new windows and that would help the energy efficiency in that building, what kind of savings can we have do by doing some of the mechanical efficiencies that Steve talked about. Also, to, the board will look at what are the plans for the existing facilities. Um, in some cases, they may look at potential site selection if we're feeling like we're busting at the seams in some particular area and we need to look at some additional um, property acquisition. We want to look at an extensive uh, financial analysis on what kind of an impact this would have to our taxpayers. Because we want to make sure, once again, that, that everybody feels that what we move forward with is the right plan for our district and that, that our community can support it. We also want to make, um, identify a project timeline and what some of the project costs are. And if we pass a referendum, what would the transition planning look like? For instance, if we're doing work in one of the elementary schools, um, what will the transition be? Where will the kids be in school while that work's being done? Or will we be able to do it all during the summer? What will the transition plan be like for that? So the Board of Education then will take all of this information. They're going to get binders full of information to try to come up with the best decision to move forward into phase five, and that is the bond election and process itself. Now, a lot of people ask me a couple of questions, two specific questions that I hear a lot, even when I'm downtown. One is, first of all, does the board already know what their project is, what they're going to do, what they're going to move forward um, as far as the facilities? And the answer is sincerely and truly no. There is no plan in place at this time. We have, the board did approve the, the work that was done by the Cunningham Group, our Community Citizens Committee, um, that that work is final and that we've taken that overall comprehensive assessment of all the buildings. But now they really want to go through these six phases to make sure that we're hearing from the public so that any project they decide on is a project that we can all buy into and work towards together. Second thing that I get asked a lot is um, if there's going to be a bond referendum uh, within our school district, um, do we know when that's going to be? The answer is we don't know yet because we need to get all this data, we need to uh, visit with people, we need to find out what that plan looks like. The one thing I do share with people though is that I think it's pretty safe to say that it will be within a year that within the next year we will probably be going to our public to ask for some kind of a bond referendum. At that time then, when the board does it, they will select the date. They will also be looking, encouraging public review and looking at the proposed facilities plan and have several people available to help with, 
to identify what the tax impact would be for each individual person or business or family. They'll, we also will be putting together something called the review and comment, which is uh, an idea of what the plan is that you turn into the Minnesota Department of Education. And you have to get approval for that before you can go up for a referendum. And finally, they will also develop what the ballot question looks like. The board will decide, is it going to be a one question on the ballot? Or is it going to be numerous questions on the ballot that people will have an opportunity to vote for? And so that will all be decided when we come together. Right now, we are just very excited. Um, although, and the sixth phase is if we pass this election, that we will be moving into the construction management <coughs> phase. We are very excited because these six phase, the phases, we believe, are the direction that we need to go in order to make the best decision for our public. In December, we put together a request for quotes asking for firms that have experience and success with um, helping school districts to uh, get to this point through these phases um, to help us with this six-phase process. In January, we had just an absolutely wonderful proposal from three companies that collaborated together to help us through this process. Foster, Jacobs, and Johnson, and we have representatives from them tonight who are going to take us through the listening session, are here. I have Kevin Denae here with Lucille Smith and Milton, who is a partner in this process, and representatives from Pro Sanderson that are going to help um, all of us to, to figure out what that right plan is and what we can recommend to our board members. And I'm so happy to see Bob here um, in representation from the board. And Tom Higlin just had to leave, um, but I thank you both for being here and for helping us through this process. So that's where we're at. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the next about 45 minutes or so and representatives from Foster, Jacobs, and Johnson are going to bring you through a really fun activity. And it really is talking, they're going to t bring you through an activity talking about what you believe is great about the school district, what you believe some of the challenges are, what recommendations you give to the Board of Education and the, and the decision makers in this process, and just to be able to hear from you. So. I want to say thank you for being here. Um, have fun in, in this next process because this is my favorite part as we get to um, hear what everyone has to say. So thank you very much for being here tonight. And Glenn, I don't know, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Lane. Yeah. Um, welcome. And thank you for coming out. Uh, come out here tonight. It's uh, oftentimes when we do community forums, it's we refer to it almost as crap shoot. You never know if you're going to have just a handful or you're going to have 50, 60, or, or, or above. And we've had those kinds of problems. But my name is Glenn Chido, and I work with Foster Jacobs and Johnson. I'm a retired superintendent, actually. Uh, I retired from Park Rapids six years ago and uh, went to work. Actually, I retired on a Friday. Went to work with uh, FJJ on a Monday, so I've, I've clearly I failed the retirement gig so far, and uh, but I'm still here, still doing this, and this is the type of thing that, uh, that they have me doing or working with community groups, civic groups, and so forth and so on as far as as listening sessions. Prior to my time at Park Rapids, I was down in southern Minnesota, the Renville, which is just south of. Uh, I see a smile. You know where Renville is? Thank you. Uh, are you from that area? No. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, but I was down in Renville County West, which is just south of the Wilmer. It's uh, Daniel, Renville, Sacred Heart. It's on that 212 corridor. But most of my time in education, and I've got about 30 some years, uh, but most of my time happened to be up in Thief River Falls. And that's where I taught and coached. And quite honestly, um, through my career, I was actually in a middle school for many, many years. I was an assistant principal. I was a teacher first, assistant principal, principal. So I've had some time in the building. Uh, just like this. Before I go too much farther, though, I'm going to let my son introduce himself here. Uh, but this is my boss, actually, and I'll let him get into a little bit of who he is. Good evening, everybody. I'm not nearly as long winded as Glenn. Uh, Dave Bergeron, I'm one of the principal owners with Foster Jacobs and Johnson. Uh, grew up in a small town in northern Minnesota, and for the better part of the last 25 years, have worked almost exclusively with school districts in outstate Minnesota 
helping to address needed facility and educational infrastructure. So excited to be here working with you tonight. So thanks. Some things that we're going to do tonight, um, we've got just some open-ended questions. They're basically, we're going to ask for your opinions relative to what you think, how you feel, et cetera. You didn't have to study for this test. It's a pretty easy piece. If you choose not to write anything, uh, that's fine as well. But we've, we've put post-it notes out in front of hopefully all of you with a, with a Sharpie, and we would ask you to write your response on the post-it note. Uh, if you have multiple responses, then go ahead and write multiple post-it notes. Now, the one thing about FJJ uh, that they're very good at, they, they hire a lot of us retired educators. So if there's anybody in here that's an educator, this is what you have to look forward to. I think that you're, you're a teacher here, right? Correct? Um, here's the thing. I get paid by the post-it note, and so hopefully you're going to write plenty of these uh, because it, it means a lot to me right now. The other part of this piece, is, and I forgot to say this, and I have said this in virtually every group, that, that uh, I've been part of. I've known Lane since 1983. Uh, we go way, way back, back into the teaching days. And so I actually do have a lot of dirt on her. So if anybody's interested, I can be bought, and I have a lot of information. But here's the kicker. I've done part many of these sessions. I actually have one more piece to share on this. I also know Mr. Anderson very, very well. I was teaching when he was in school. So equally, as much dirt as I have on this lady, I have on him when he was in school. So I can help out in that capacity. Well, that's a two-way street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, John was in, he actually was in school when I was teaching. So first time I talked to him and I saw him, he's grown up and he's, he's a principal now. It's, it, it aged me right away. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to ask some questions. I'm, please put the post-it note in front of you. I'm going to pick it up. I'll read it off and put it up on the board and then we're just going to kind of Kind of go through this when we've exhausted a question, then we'll move on to the next question. Questions for me? Okay, here's the first one. If you were going to explain to me, my child is going to move into the area, uh, and we have a lot of people that certainly move into communities and so forth and so on, they always run into folks on the street, grocery store, joining church, et cetera, et cetera. They have kids. They want to know about what's going on in the school district as far as positive things. I mean, why would I want to have, have my children enrolled in this particular school district, whether it's this school, elementary, or the high school. So if you're going to tell me the fantastic things or the great things about the school district, what would you tell me? Please write it on a post-it note. I'll pick it up. But what would you say? You were part of, you were part of this before, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, it does so. Yeah. Okay, no cheating now. You know all the questions. What would you say? And if you hear something and you you think that's your idea? Write it again, because yeah. we look for kind of trending in these as well. Just put it out in front of you, we'll pick it up and... Close to the community within the building. <laughs> World-class education and brain health. Wonderful oh, teacher. Is this one? No, it's not, okay. The staff, teachers, administration, Work, works together well to, to serve the students. We've got elementary schools feel small, lots of opportunities for activities and athletics. Lots of opportunities in all four A's. Lots of options for after school activities. Quality schools, quality community, collaboration, quality staff. Teachers who care about kids beyond classroom. Middle school facility and teams. Various activities, extracurricular to involve students. Caring. Caring staff. Very opportunities for students. Teachers and staff who care for their students. Smaller school, lots of opportunities, academic, etc. Anything else? <coughs> yeah. Uh oh. Sorry. Sorry. Teachers who go out of their way to enrich students. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, so many opportunities available for students. Else? That's okay. 
Lots of opportunities for academic, athletics, extracurricular. Okay, let's let's uh, and if you if you think of something later, we can add to this. This is not a, a one and done kind of a scenario, but let's let's move on to the next one. Let me read this one first. Encourage parent involvement. Working in Grafton, North Dakota, it's one of my many stories. After six years, you get plenty of these because I've worked with students and community groups and teachers and so on and so forth. We always ask pretty much the same questions. Grafton, North Dakota, group of high school stu uh, students, I said, okay, now we're going to flip the hourglass over, meaning positive to, to my mind, positive to challenges. Not a student in the room doing an hourglass was. Everybody had big eyes looking at me and said, okay, folks. Let's go to the other one. So challenges. And every district has them. Nobody's immune to this piece. What are our challenges that we also face, maybe in the school and or district-wide, whichever you choose to, to choose to rank it? But what challenges do we face? Class size is too large. Let me uh, also just because I, if you write, uh, if you have children in another school and you're gonna you're gonna make reference to something related to that school, let put it on the post-it note. For instance, were you talking about classroom space here or at the other at, at Wesby or across the board? No. Okay. Large geographic area. We got uh, there's there is not enough focus on the gifted and talented group. Cramped spaces at elementary schools. Elementary schools running out of space. Funding, class size, student slash teacher ratio. Running out of space at the elementary schools. Technology at the high school. Funding funding for needed staff positions. Lack of space in elementary schools. Low in parentheses. Large class sizes, crowded classrooms. Lack of oops, go ahead, Brian. Lack of cultural diversity in staff and students. Population increase, we build schools. Population decrease, we sell schools. Need more foreign language offerings. Gifted and talented by class versus one large group for all class. Aging buildings equal higher maintenance costs. Gifted education beyond elementary. Got elementary school buildings too small. And then, and then a second one on here. Technology not up to date. Uh, I've already read this one. This is the university one. Anything else? It is so small in Riverside. <laughs> Anybody? Anything else? All right, let's jump to the next one. Here's an opportunity for you um, that uh, we think that potentially you might have a career in this area. Uh, and I say that because we have the media here tonight. But if you were going to write the headlines for the newspaper 10 years from now, what would you want it to say about the Brainerd School System? You're going to write the headlines for the newspaper 10 years from now. What would you want it to say about the Brainerd School System? Now we get to do. If you do a really good job, we'll, we'll submit it to the newspaper resume. Who knows? What would you want it to say? Great community school. That was it. Okay. Brainerd scores high in achievement tests. Has one of the best gifted and talented programs in the state.
great improvement within the district in technology and technology spacing and education. Foresight and planning helps meet needs of all students. ISD 181 model for community involvement, workforce, and workforce development. Prepare students for college or work. Brainerd schools produce community leaders. School updates more than meets population increase. I don't know if anybody in this room has a high school student, but I had the luxury and the, the opportunity to do this exact same thing with your high school students. A group of, I think they were juniors and seniors, or for the most part, they were phenomenal. The, I'm not just saying that they were great. They were fun to be around. They were respectful. The one thing, though, that's always interesting about kids in high school, we always do it with high school uh, students, is they really don't have an adult filter. So they really tell you what it's all about. And they were, they were, they were really, really good. So we had a great session with them. We got a lot of good feedback from them as well. Uh, Brainerd, among top schools again, and then parentheses, graduation test score, scores. Anything else? Lane Larson finishes 10th year as superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a good one. She finally retires. Lane Larson the door. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, our next question is specifically related to facilities. And it's actually a two part question, so stay with me on this. First of all, let me read this one. President of USA, graduate from Brainerd School. Okay, this is a, basically a facility question. So if you're familiar with any other building along with this one in the district, please again identify this if you have a response. But if you are going to uh, uh, suggest any ideas relative to improvements and or updates, if you will, to help enhance the education of our students in the in the district, district-wide, what would it be? Facility now, talking about facilities. I'm gonna break it in. Let me tell you what the second part. The second part, we're gonna focus on this building right here. But if we're talking district-wide, suggestions from you that if we were going to improve and uh, enhance, excuse me, repair or, and or improve a building that you're familiar with to, that would help enhance the education of the students in that building district-wide, what would it be? And again, we'll get to this building here in a second. But this one is just a district-wide one first. Uh, more media library space at Lowell. I, uh, I gave that, I was at the chamber meeting today, I gave the example of the first time I walked into the media space at Lowell. I was shocked. I walked in through the, in a sense I'll call it the back door. Um, there's a special ed area. And I asked the principal, where's the, where's the media center? Pulled the curtain back, and here were the, here's the books. I was just blown away with that scenario. So District-wide, Media Center Lowell. Gyms at the elementary level. Appropriate classrooms for appropriate students. Swimming pool and art center, that actually came up today. Uh, flexible learning spaces in elementary. Lowell, another one. More uh, library space at Lowell. More classrooms out of the basement. Storage rooms all underlined. Move, excuse me. <laughs> now that's bifocals. Uh, high school includes ninth grade, same building. We got improved special ed learning slash working uh, places. Again on Lowell. Update technology, another one. More classroom space, another one. Cafeteria bigger, and another one secure entrance. Green space preserved. Get classrooms out of non-traditional areas. Anything else? One comment, and, and just mainly because it came up about the security, and certainly Lane and Steve alluded to that in their presentation. I've been in the building for about the last two months. I've been in and out of buildings many, many times. 
And I think this is a credit to the, the administration, the board, and so on and so forth. But when I was in the buildings, I can't tell you how many times I was asked by people, who are you? What are you doing? Even though I had a little sticker on that said visitor, people were still asking me those questions, no matter where I went. So I, I thought that was pretty impressive relative to some of the issues we do obviously have with the secure entrances. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is this one for the district plan? Sure. More, <laughs> sure. more buildings, more uh, environmental. environmental friendly. Oh, got one. Okay, here's the second part of this. Same, for the most part, the, the same front part of it, meaning improvement, repairs to enhance the education. But now let's focus on this building. What would you suggest or recommend? Uh, this one goes to our last one. All schools drop off to pick up here and pick up areas. But now we're going to talk about this building. What suggestions would you make, comments relative to help to improve the education piece here? Repairs or, or improvements? For us to do better pickup and drop off area. Oh. <laughs> I'm so little, sorry. Oh, no, that's all right. <coughs> I'll just go to the last one. Apologize for not reading it. Yeah, yeah, last one. Well, that one? Take advantage of Forest View forests and green space for educational experience in a parentheses outdoor classroom. Better safety measures and entrance. entrances. Drop off and pick up. Improve. <laughs> Boy, this is shocking. Impro improve, drop off, and pick up. And for, uh, force, force you. Okay, John, no fair. You can't, I, I can't help you. you can't be writing anything, John. He did that in high school, too. He's always trying to cheat. Cool. <laughs> More use of space between wings enhanced with trees and garden. Anything else? Better supervision for hallways, pod areas. Anything else? Auditorium. Community center with Baxter. Anything else? No pressure, we're all looking at you right now. <laughs> Is it oh. Better, 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 oh yeah, isn't that the truth? Better big screen for cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I came to deliver the results to the staff, and as John was thought, kind of alluding to, the staff all sat right up there. I was up here. And I had to get up next to the screen just to be able to read that good figure out. Was anybody even going to be able to see what I was? That was that was difficult for sure. Especially there was a little sunlight coming through that particular day. Here's the anything else on that last question? Here's the last question then. Lane's alluded to it, Steve's talked about it. At some point in time, certainly sooner than later, they're going to get a lot of stuff from us and, and the various uh, uh, people involved in this. Uh, in terms of data and information and pricing and so on and so forth. At that point, they've got to start breaking some things down. And then there's a lot, many, many more steps other than what we've done up to this point in time. So if you are going to give them advice as they move forward in the process, I'm not talking about specific programs now or anything of that nature per se, but if you are going to give them advice as they start to get into this, what would it be? And you don't have to put it on a post note. Mr. Bergeron here will write it. So what advice would you give them as they move forward in this process? Go ahead and if you want to raise your hand or just go ahead. Keep the elementary schools in the name of us. Who that are, I should say. Okay. 
Anybody catches him on bad spelling because he is horrible and he's yeah. done it just go ahead and say so. Okay. Anything else? Keep the neighborhood elementary schools. Remember that in the next four years, the 65 and older crowd will outnumber the 500 crowd. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> Aging population? Aging population. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> We don't need this. Yeah, that hurts. Yes, but I understand yeah. taxpayers. So yes. I, I suppose to tag into that, we need to convince them yes. that it's a benefit to mm -hmm. them. Benefit to the whole community. Yes. yes. Has to make sense to them. The good news is, honestly, historically, in my travels, my age group, they 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 value education, but you got to make it make sense to them if you want them to raise their hand, <coughs> or check the right box, or whatever that is. If you can do that, they'll vote yes. But you, but you have to take those liberties to do that. If you just throw it out, chances are they're gonna. Go Is that why they recruited you? We just met. No, no, no. That probably is. Yeah, to be honest with you, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the last standing almost. But no, it is it, it truly it's a good point. Yes. Um, also, to tag onto that is explaining the technology side of yeah. some of the things because there's even between me and what my kids know how to do is huge between yeah. them and what my parents know. Oh, yeah. I have a senior grandson who lives in Monticello. I call him all the time because he's well into this, and I have no clue how to do half of what needs to be done. Then he also. Yeah. Or why it would benefit the students and cost and maintain it. So they're just in a different place. I'm not sure. Separate your wants and needs. Separate your wants and needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Yes. I would say continue to be transparent in what. Transparency, yeah. you bet. Continue to transparency. Yeah. And also view this as an opportunity. I mean, I think some of, especially like in terms of if it was new construction, it's an opportunity. I mean, you brought up maintenance costs, but it's an investment. And to sell it to the community is, I mean, sometimes you invest more money up front, but the long-term payoff can be. It's like the old Fram oil filter, pay me now or pay me later. Yeah. Right. And I, mean, yeah. I think I just think of some of the things, too, with improvements in technology in terms of building buildings, too, with increased energy efficiency. And I mean, those are opportunities that this potentially why I'm in school district right now. I've often thought, oh, again, over the travels, that all of us or most of us either own a home or own something that you have to maintain. So if you can somehow provide the information to show that piece that you're worried about, whether it's your house, your car, or whatever that is, it's no different here. You've got to maintain it. You've got to hang on to it and make it work for as long as they can. And if you can justify it in some reasonable fashion, people okay. get it. Or even, you know, I think of, uh, I said uh, at one time, another conversation, um, a different school district, but like installing solar panels, for example. I mean, that's an upfront cost, but it pays itself off mm -hmm. over the long term. And so I think there's opportunities there where if you can convince people, you put the investment in, but you know, over the long term, this would actually save us money. We actually heard a little bit of that at the high school. Last night. Yeah, last night. night. Yeah. Similar, very similar yeah. concepts yeah. of your time. Do you have opportunity for investment in? District community. Energy efficiency and we do that upfront cost, but long term chaos. Lane, take this one. Is there another sheet back there? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Knowing his physical well being, yeah. he's never going to get back to the Does that make sense? View as opportunity for investment, upfront cost versus return. Okay. Okay.
Anything else? Yes? What about more student input? Student more student input? input? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Again, we, you know, we have met over, you know, again, at the time I've been doing this, we've always met with usually high school students. Uh, I know in a couple cases, in a couple districts, we ended up meeting with some middle school kids. I know Lane has had some meetings with middle school students, and so not in the sense of a listening session like this, but having, oh, kind of yeah, kind of, you know, get, taking some feedback. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. I mean, I'll tell you, honestly, the student group here, not unlike a lot of student groups, they'll tell you right up front, listen to us, make sure it works for us, not me personally, but us, and, and put students first, et cetera, et cetera. They, they'll come along with that. The other thing they always come along with is they don't like the food, so they got to take care of the food kind of issues. But nonetheless, it's, there you go, right? Yeah, there's that. That's, yep, food. Always high on the list for kids. Yeah, I mean, if the kids are going home telling their parents yes. every day, District yeah. doesn't have to work so hard individually yeah. to help sell it. Right. Yes. I think staff will also have good ideas. Teachers staff, staff. Yeah. We've done a, you know, throughout the district mm -hmm. in all the buildings, uh, we've done educational adequacy listening sessions with staff. In terms of the certified staff, we've done these types of sessions with all the non-certified folks across the district. So we've. As Lane's alluded to, we've, we've got well into about 50 to 55, 60 listening sessions done. Actually, tonight's the last one of this round, so to speak. But good input. Anything else? Okay. We might want to look at increase and decrease, but with our population peaks and then decrease, in the past it's always been we build. Now we don't need it, we sell it. We build it, now we don't need it, we sell it. So in some of these, we want to look at that future, yes, we're building, but if our population decreases, then what can we use that building portions of for maybe we can bring these community offices in the end or something so that we're still getting it maintained and used, but maybe then when the population increases again, we can bring that portion back to the district. So build with flexibility. And flexibility. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because okay. even in the, the beginning where we showed all the different schools, there was one that wasn't even Edison was built and sold within there. Yeah. And sold yeah. And yeah. all along the time. Yeah. And then, you know, and I know Steve and Lane and the board certainly this whole demographic piece. It's, yeah. it's just. It's so essential to the long range piece to understand do you have it? Yeah. You know, don't build it and then the day shall come. You never know that. But right. do we have it? Does it actually show that? And I know that yeah. they've spent a lot of time already looking at those kinds of things. But it's important for sure. Because there's always community offices that are looking for right. a place to be. Mm -hmm. And some of them are in church basements, some of them are in you know, some So there, there is that if our population does drop off, Okay. Anything else? Any any other ideas or advice, if you will? Any question? Well, any questions uh, for us or for Lane, uh, school board members that are member of us here? Any questions across or Steve that you may have at this point? The voice results were done last night, so we don't have to run over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were. So we're pretty much in that second, that second stage of the sixth phase? Correct. We're in the second phase right now. We're collecting the information. You know, we, we're doing these listening sessions but to collect the data, but we're going to be coming out to the public throughout this entire process, um, even if it's not a listening session. But just to keep people informed, we'll be holding meetings throughout the community, uh, throughout the duration of this whole process. Same thing within our, within our schools uh, for all of our staff, because we want to have avenues where people can get their questions answered and also where people can continue to give us input. Um, like I said earlier, uh, we, we truly want to make the right decision when we finally decide what our project's going to be 
and that we're going to go forward. And, and um, the, only, the only way we're going to do it is if we do it together. And so it's, it's really a fun process for us to, uh, to really unite as a, as a community to move forward. So. I'd like to say one more thing. And once again, thank you for coming out tonight on this beautiful, beautiful night. Um, you know, I, you drive into Forest View and it could not be more lovely. Um, I've said this um, to many people and some of you probably have heard me say it, but you know, uh, Brainerd has been on my radar for a long time because of the tradition of excellence that is known statewide about the work that's done here, the quality of teaching staff, um, the, the outcomes that our children are able, that they come out of our school with, and the difference that each of you makes um, in our communities. And so, to, first of all, to be have the honor of being selected to serve as your superintendent was an honor in and, in and above anything I could have ever imagined. But the last 10 months have just been really awesome. Um, it's been a high learning curve. You're smiling at me, and so I, you know, it, it has. <laughs> um, because you know, but I have to tell you that this school district is so much greater than I ever imagined, and um, it, so much of it is our kids are just so awesome. It's so fun to have the kids here tonight and, and giving us their input as well. But the teaching staff and how the community supports this school district is just above what you could ever imagine. And so I know I speak on behalf of the board and um, the entire district. Just thank you for all that you've done. Um, this is such a great place, and it's because of all of you and everybody working together to make it what it is today. So thank you for coming, and uh, we look forward to lots more collaborations. Mm -hmm. You could just leave the stuff there. We'll pick it up. We'll pick it up. So thank you. Thank you.